Welcome to the Online Great Books Podcast, brought to you by OnlineGreatBooks.com, where we talk about the good life, the great books, great conversation, and great ideas. I'm Scott Hambrick. I'm Carl Shute. And today, on the Online Great Books Podcast, we'll read uh, this little book here from the Young Adult section. Look at that. nine ninety five. it says on there. Faraday's Chemical History of a Candle. Yeah, I got mine from Dover, and it was fourteen ninety five. This one's used. This one's used. Uh, it was from the San Jose Public Library. I buy a lot of used books, you know, on the interwebs, and so many of them are being sold out of libraries' collections. I, I don't know. Apparently, I don't know what libraries are for. Oh, no, I, I know what they're for. Do tell. They are gathering spaces. For walkers? For whoever. For um, their community centers, their gathering spaces. They are, um, they are places to propagate the propaganda, mm. uh, to disseminate university libraries. I used to work in universities, and I have a whole bunch of really good books that nobody cared about that I liberated because they were just going to throw them away. Right. Because they don't have any use for books. Uh, what do you need books for if you have Wikipedia? I was writing on Twitter the other day. You can follow me at, I'm at Hambrick Scott there. And I said, I said that it's time for people to start working on a family library, which doesn't mean, you know, these are the books I've read and I didn't get rid of them. I mean, like, like building a collection mm -hmm. and having a library of things that a family would need. And uh, the reason I put this out, this tw tweet out or the series of tweets is because, well, number one, I believe that you need to do that. But I was, I was digging a ditch and I was thinking about AI. Mm -hmm. And I realized that... As one does. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. I realized that, uh, you know, they already know everything about us. You know, you, you get on your computer, you buy something from Amazon, and they're like, oh, okay, Carl buys pruning shears from Amazon and uh, beef bullion-favored butt plugs. So we know everything we need to know about Carl. <laughs> I, sir, I do not. <laughs> or, or whatever, you know, for instance... Would never buy pruning shoes. All right. And the next thing you know, so they, they, they've, they've built an avatar. They. Like big data has an avatar of your spending habits and your preferences and whatever. And then you go to, to Google and you, you, um, you search for something. Mm -hmm. It could be a how-to or it could be a what's this kind of a query. It could be about political events. It could be whatever. Well, with AI knowing who you are, like big data, Google, for example, or Amazon knowing who you are, they can instantly generate the content that you've searched for and display that content to you without regard to truth, right? They could just like, oh, okay, Carl just made a query. Uh, we're going to design the output to meet, you know, to, to seemingly meet the requirements of his query, but Actually, we're right. optimizing it for his time on our page, the click-through rate, and his likelihood to click on an ad on that page. So, you know, yeah. you're, you're not, you know, if you go to scotthamburg.com or carlshoot.com, you know, those pages aren't dynamic. I mean, I mean, they're dynamic. They'll, they'll fit on a mobile device they're, they're, or a desktop. They're pretty shitty. Right. But we've yeah. got bad websites. That nothing's changed. You know, the content's not changing on there. Even if there's a typo, I don't change them. Uh, but, but if you go to the New York Times, I mean, I don't know that they're doing this, but it is coming. And what they're going to tell you is you're going to get a customized content experience. That's what they're going to tell you. But what that means mm -hmm. is that they've th completely thrown out, you know, truth. And sometimes we need to know the truth. You know, what's the firing order for my tractor? What I mean, all kinds of stuff. You need to know the truth. Like, what are the combustion products of a paraffin candle? And the likelihood of us finding that truth online decreases every minute. Yeah, so there's a, the, what do they say? The internet is dead. I remember that I've been yeah. an internet person for a long, long time. I think it was probably 1998. Uh, 
Oh no, it was earlier than that. It was yeah. 92. Yeah, I was 92 or three. But I, 92 that I start, first started futzing around on, on this thing. I think I had the, was it Mozilla? Was that the first one? Netscape. Mosaic. Mosaic. Mosaic was the first one with a text browsing. Uh, it was awesome. And you used to be able to do things that Bronze Age guy talks about this. You used to be able to search for something and come up with it. Like if I wanted to search for, like I, I was just looking something up. If I wanted to search for a particular thought on Western implementations of Byzantine art, I just type as much as I knew, and there'd be the article, a forum talking about the article, somebody complaining about the article. You could find exactly what you wanted on the first page. Um, or a PDF of an old book. I was looking for Burkhardt's book. I, I ended up buying it, um, the, the book on the ancient Greeks. Hmm. But you used to be able to find exactly what you wanted, and now you, you just can't. You, you can't. kids today, you don't know. You can't find what you want. Nobody even uses Google to find anything. They use Instagram or Reddit. Because your, your first page of searches are doing a predictive model of you and your search habits, and what they're showing you is not what you're looking for. They're showing you what will optimize your behavior for their purposes. And so that's at, that's at the search engine level. The next level would be the result you get will be dynamic. Like you click away from Google and the result that comes up in front of you will be fake. I mean, nobody else will ever see it. It'll be displayed to you. Mm -hmm. uh, the link to that will be hashed. So if you, you cite it and somebody checks your source, the citation will go to that dynamic page, but you may be the only person that has ever seen it. Yeah. And so, so you know, everybody will be like, well, I checked the sources. Like, it was the same. You know, I mean, I looked, and that's what it said, sure enough. Yeah, yeah. Uh, which is not to say that you couldn't have a, a an actual book that is full of falsehoods. Oh, sure. But because it has to be put on paper and published it's a little bit more durable it's more truthy well that's enough. It's, at least it's more durable i've been thinking about they have um, to they have to the faraday they have to immortalize their manipulation when they put it in print you know yeah yeah and, and we'll we'll definitely get to faraday because this is a good book and you ought to if you have time you ought to read it uh but i've been thinking about the writer's strike a little bit these poor actors and writers uh they should learn to code, you know. They they are not smart enough. And besides, the AI can code. I think it will be. I've I've already seen some of these AI generated movies, movie trailers. Mm -hmm. There's no humans involved. You know, somebody came up with the idea and then sketched it together in in 20 minutes, and you look at it and, wow, that looks great. It's going to be pretty soon. You don't have movies. You know, uh, you say, I'm going to sit down and watch a movie, and it might ask you some questions. It might propose you a custom-made movie that hits all your buttons. You know, plucky heroine, uh, finds the MacGuffin, suffers much, sees an unlikely romance, saves the world. You know, it, it'll be completely designed mm -hmm. for you with no human actors involved. Voice acting, you won't need voice actors because... Um, I played around with that a bit. You can get AI people to read your stuff. If you want to make, um, I, I did that on Instagram. I made a little dialogue of me talking to an AI broad, an AI woman, mm. a, 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 skirt, an artificial lady. Skirt, frail, dame, broad, chick. <laughs> yeah. Um, and uh, she sounded pretty convincing. It, it's not going to be very long before pod's almost over you know there's there's yeah. there's well over i don't know there's a couple of thousand hours of my voice out there um yeah yeah they so, did one of uh it was it was pretty entertaining they did one of uh dasha and anna from the red scare arguing about pokemon mm. it was it was very funny but you know they never said it right so you get your custom you get your custom virtual world pretty soon, as long as the power doesn't run out, uh, catered to your every whim, except it's not catered to your every whim, it's actually shaping your every whim. Uh, 
Yeah, it's not great. So how does Michael Faraday fix this? Getting a, a physical copy? <sighs> what's the what's the tie-in? Well, I don't know if I can bring it back to Faraday necessarily. The the whole thing was I just looked down here and saw that this, you know, San Jose Public Library decided they didn't need this book anymore. And they're mm. they're wrong. They do need this book. This book right here, this book right here shows you how to rebuild that piece of the world. You know, Faraday takes a mm-hmm. candle and stuff that you have in your kitchen and figures out what the combustion products are and explicates a candle. And it's just beautiful and elegant. And, um, you know, when people say trust the science right now, those people aren't doing Faraday's type of science. You know, so Far- Faraday is an engineer. Like today, he would be called an engineer. Mm-hmm. He's a very practical guy who gets candle wax under his fingernails. If he's gonna, if he's gonna work on candles, you know, in, in investigating a candle, he works with candles and his intellect and a few things that are at hand and does amazing things. It's just so elegant and wonderful. Um, so I don't know that I can bring my scare about you know dynamic web content and AI back to Faraday, but. Um, I think if you're a homeschool person, if you're, uh, you need to have this, um, the, the, the book I have, um, it has, uh, I think it's about 80 pages, the lectures, these are children's lectures, by the way, or lectures for children that Faraday would do Mm -hmm. most, most famous scientists in the world, probably at the time, he would do these in England in the summer, uh, every year in the 1850s. Um, and there are 22 experiments I don't know how many lectures, I can't remember. I don't know, a half dozen lectures, let's say. And then 22 experiments. And in the um, edition I have uh, has some some, uh, kind of pared down uh, instructions and explanations of the experiments as well. And, uh, you know, homeschool folks ought to to do do this. Uh, Because so much, so much, so much. You know, middle school science, it's just like putting baking soda in vinegar and like, you know, this volcano book. Like, it's not, I don't even know what any of it is, but this is real investigative science. Well, and it's fire. And it's fire. Right, which is cool. Because you can burn stuff, like yourself or your friends, or you could burn your house down, which is which is very cool. It makes it much more interesting. Yeah, I thought it was good. I thought it was enjoyable. Um, I did not reproduce any of the experiments. Nor did not I. having candles around. But uh, you could. Just be careful with the hydrogen. Yeah. Well, and the oxygen. Uh, lecture one, part one. Paragraph one. I propose to bring before you in the course of these lectures the chemical history of a candle. There is not a law under which any part of this universe is governed which not does not come into play and is touched upon in these phenomena. There is no better, there is no more open door by which you can enter into the study of natural philosophy than by considering the physical phenomena of a candle. Mm-hmm. Yeah, so the history of a candle, that's an interesting word. Why pick history? The chemical history. We would say chemical composition or something. Yeah. Uh, I didn't look that up on OED, did you? No, I didn't. History is like, um, well, history originally means researches, but comes to be what happens over time. Um, I don't know, it's kind of dynamic. You know, what what's going on in a candle? There's a lot of action in a candle. I remember um, when I was much younger... I ha- we had a class in high school, anatomy and physiology, and I hated it. It was boring. Um, I got an A, of course, but I wasn't smart enough to get straight C's. But uh, it was uh, it was boring. It's like drawing those little potato those little p- potato pancake drawings of a cell. This is the nucleus. Here's the cell wall. Here's the RNA. There's your mitochondria, the powerhouse of the cell, and. Uh, it was terrible, and it became much better when I studied it 20 years later and found out that really everything in there is in battle with everything else. There's a whole lot of action going on. It's not a static thing. It's, um, I mean, the cell wall is like a, 
it's a it's like a war zone you know and then there's it's made out of cholesterol and you have like the fat feeling the, the stuff that likes fat that buries its head in there and the tail goes out the other way and it's it, it, it was pretty interesting if you just told me well the products of the combustion of the candle are water and carbon dioxide boring you know, boring but now here's here's fire Let's start from zero. How do we know anything about what's going on in that? What is a candle? You know, what's it made of? Uh, let me show you a candle. Here, let me light it. Um, it. It seems to me, even in my aged state, it seems to me that it's... Andy Baker called me a boomer on Instagram. What? He called me a boomer. He's 41. He's a child. And then he accused me of being a boomer. What did you do? How dare you. I double posted a, a response to him. Oh. And so he made fun of my technological ability. He's telling you wanted to make sure he paid attention. <laughs> uh, but for me, having it be practical, dynamic, by which I mean talking about all of the things that are actually happening. I don't know. That That makes it more exciting to me. Yes. Rather than, you know... A formula showing me the chemical products. Big deal. Yeah, seeing that it happens. And then, like he says here at the beginning, there is not a law under which any part of this universe is governed, which is, does not come into play. It is touched upon in these phenomenon. Yeah. You know, he... Yeah, he just, it's a microcosm. He just starts off and tells you, I, I kind of wish he had said, this ain't about candles, guys. This is about every mm -hmm. darn thing in the universe. But we can't hold the universe in our hand and, and do experiments on it with the in the kitchen. But we can start with this candle. Yeah, you got to start somewhere. Um, you're always gonna. Okay, all right. So I'm gonna go off on a tangent here. All right. It's like, it's like, uh, dear listener, it's like when you drop into the Iliad, and uh, you're immediately in this fight between these two guys, and you don't know who they are. And you don't know why they're fighting. It starts in media rest, starts in the middle of things. Well, that's the way that you have to do any research. You can't start from the beginning. You have to get dropped in somewhere. So here's the candle. But you're better off. The closer you can get to the beginning, the better off you would be, I would say. If you could get there, what would be the beginning of science? Well, metaphysics, but um, in terms of physical investigations, um, a candle's about as close as you can get to the beginning. Okay, so metaphysics. Very good. Uh, Aristotle says all knowledge comes through the senses. You can't start with metaphysics much as you would want to. It, metaphysics, first philosophy, the knowledge of the causes. You only get to the causes. You're using them all the time, but you only get to your uh, understanding of the causes backwards. You, you're going to start with something like a candle and end up with the unmoved mover. Fair enough. Unless you you have an angelic intellect. But it's it's best that you start with a candle and not a um, you know a Wankel engine or something. Sure. Or even a, an ordinary science textbook. Yeah. Which gives you a bunch of propositions to remember. Now, let's just talk about a candle. Everybody knows what a candle is, right? Don't you know what a candle is? Well, in case you don't, he tells you, here are a couple of candles commonly called dips. They're made of lengths of cotton cut off, hung by a loop, dipped into melted tallow, taken out again and cooled, then re-dipped. Um, and then he, he talks about like the physical form of the candle... And how elegant and amazing it is. And it is. You know, the, it is. Yeah, you know, the, the, the wax, the tallow, the stearin, the whatever they're made out of has a melting point. Duh. And they're, they're so elegant that this candle, the diameter of that candle when properly made, means that the outer part of the candle is below its melting point. But the, the outer part of the tip of the candle will be below the melting point, and the center will be at the melting point, or, and it forms a pool of molten fuel 
right about the wick. Mm-hmm. Which, if it didn't do it, you couldn't make a candle. Which, if it didn't do, you couldn't make a candle. So this, these, these greases, these oils that uh, set at room temperature, that solidify it at room temperature, and then melt. I don't even know what the melting point of tallow would be. I mean, it's it's just one of these elegant, some might say coincidences, that that allows the candle to work. You know, if if a if a burning cotton wick would not get hot enough to melt the, the candle, then there would be no fuel. It would burn the wick down to the fuel down mm-hmm. to the solid fuel, and then that would be the end of that. And it would smoke, and that would be the end. Um, if it melted. If it melted at a at a lower point than it does, then you would have lamp fuel, and you would have to have a lamp. That would have to be your technology. You couldn't have mm-hmm. a candle that you carried around. You would have a, a a fuel that was solid, and then you warmed it with your hand or something, and then it would liquefy, and then you could have a lamp. So, yeah. Well, uh, so who cares about candles? Well, you care about candles, dear listener. I mean, uh, it probably one of the the lamp and then the candle, without that, you have to go to bed when the sun goes down. You know, without that, there's no civilization. You know, there's no people sitting in rooms and having symposia. You know, there's no, you're at the mercy of the day and the night cycle. Somebody figured out how to burn fat and to make light. We have no idea who it is. Probably, I'm guessing probably the lamp was first. So you have a bowl probably. and it's full of olive oil, and you, you, you left a rag in there, which presuppose no, it's probably not a rag, it's probably a rush or something. You left a, some sort of plant product in there, capillary action, the oil goes up, and you lit it, and it kept burning. Oh, this is neat. You know, now I have portable light that I can take around. Yeah, because fire isn't then domesticated def- enough. Fire isn't domesticated enough for reading, for f- fine work. You, know, you have to have a lamp or a right. candle, or better. Right. And then somebody figures out, um, how would they even figure this out? So olive oil remains liquid at room temperature. Uh, maybe you're, you're cooking your, uh, your piece of meat, your roast beef. You roast whatever they ate back then, oxen, um, unicorn, whatever. And you cook it, and you have all of this fat that comes out of it, and then you eat most of it, and then you see all this liquid stuff become solid again. So if you cook something in your skillet, um, I don't want to put that stuff in my... You know, never don't, don't put the fat in your incinerator. Just don't do it. Um, she listens to this show, but... It might have happened in my house that someone put <laughs> uh, saturated fats into the sink and I had to get it uh, no, cleaned no. out. Don't do that. Well, now you start to think, well, what could I do with that? It's solid when it's cool and it's liquid when it's hot. Then you can have a candle. It's it's amazing. Uh, you know... <sighs> It's frustrating to me. The the response to a lot of this stuff from too many people is, "Eh, so what? There are wonders around you that you should just be gobsmacked every time you see it. Like a candle is a miraculous thing. That's why they use them in church. (laughs) Um, You know, we had a kitchen out in the elements. For a couple of years there, Carl. Mm-hmm. And um, many is the time that the olive oil was set up in the jar. It was below the t- below whatever the freezing point of olive oil was in our kitchen. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Oh yeah. Yeah. <laughs> that's a. Uh, that's different. <laughs> You know, we keep baking, so, we keep baking grease in a little container that says grease on it, 
And that just sits on the stove. And it's got a, you know, I don't know, it's four inches across. You can just take a spoon and dip out that solid bacon grease mm. and put it in the skillet and then melt it. Yeah. The olive oil's in a bottle. And when it sets up, you're just, there you go. You're done. Stuck. No what olive oil. What is a spoonful of olive oil like? Uh, what like is solid olive oil? That could be a delicacy. Mm. Could probably sell it to Russians. Uh, yeah, happens a lot. <laughs> yeah, we have a uh, we got uh, coconut oil because we are seed oil disrespecters, and uh, it comes solid, but then in the house it's liquid. It's yeah. like right at because we don't keep it very cool in here, so it's like right at seventy eight degrees or something. It, it just turns liquid. Yeah, it's outrageous. I'll come and visit you guys in the fall. Um. Yeah, so he talks about the form of the candle. I don't mean the Aristotelian form, but, you know, the shape of the thing, and what are they made out of, and and how are they made? And if he doesn't say this for nothing, he's got a room full of little kids in front of him. You know, he's trying to keep their attention, but he's also trying to tell them everything that they needed to know. And they needed to know something about what candles are, and, 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 of course, all these kids, this would have been in the 1850s in London, these kids had all used candles and were part of their lives, but they probably had taken them for granted. And he he's trying to show them the candle anew before mm-hmm. they get, before they deconstruct the candle. I have a question, though. Uh-huh. Which I didn't see him answer. Uh, a, a tallow candle you can cast but you cannot cast a wax candle. Why not? I don't know that that's true. I mean, we cast beeswax candles over here. When he says wax, what is he talking about? I was thinking, is that, uh, does, maybe the wax they had doesn't shrink when it cools? We have hell getting the beeswax. So it doesn't fall out of the moon? We have hell getting the beeswax candles out of the mold. Um, Mm. They don't shrink either. We typically daughter daughter pours them and um uh, we get the hair dryer and uh have to have to heat that mold up just a little bit to get them to release and get them to come out of there cuz it doesn't hmm. shrink it doesn't shrink hmm. so maybe that's it not appreciably um, are, anyway not appreciably he says some controversial things here he shows some japanese candles that they have that some a very fine lady has brought him in my book, this is page 14. I don't know what your page numbers are. I have here also a substance brought from Japan since we have forced an entrance into that out-of-the-way place. So you have like primitive globalism there. But he says, uh, for me on page 17, about these fancy candles. You know, you get the candle that's in the shape. We had a few of these. Uh, that's carved like in the shape of flowers or something. Uh Those are lousy candles. They need to be circular, of a certain diameter. And he says, All, however, that is fine and beautiful is not useful. These fluted candles, pretty as they are, are bad candles. They are bad because of their external shape. And he says a couple of pages later, he has a theory of aesthetics, Michael Faraday does. Mm, Of course he does. Uh, So no fuel would serve for a candle which has not the property of giving this cup... Uh, that that cup on the top of your candle, and he says a little further, I hope you will now see that the perfection of a process, that is, its utility, is the better point of beauty about it. That the the beauty is in the well-functioning candle, not in the fluted candle that is carved to, to look pretty on your table. So I was noting that and harumphing. Yeah, I cannot imagine a more beautiful example than the condition of adjustment under which a candle makes one part subserve to the other to the very end of its action. A combustible thing like that, burning away gradually, never being intruded upon by the flame, is a beautiful sight, especially when you come to learn what a vigorous thing flame is, what power it has of destroying the wax itself when it gets hold of it, and of disturbing its proper form if it comes only too near. Yeah. I, I think that's probably right, but it's hard to see. You know, you, you uh, <clears throat> have you ever gone car shopping with the ladies of your house? <sighs> yes. 
have they ever said something like this? I would look cute in that. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> Which is a different aesthetic theory altogether. You know, that, that uh, there's some beauty apart from its function. Well, I don't know. I suppose there is. It doesn't matter what color things are, maybe. But when something is well-tuned and working correctly, it's just, it's pretty, I think. And if you can get yourself to see it, uh, yeah, I think that, I, I think he's right about it. What do you not there like just, about that? What's that? What, what's bumping you about that? What's bumping me is that sometimes beauty is not useful at all. So if this is your only, for me, if this is your only aesthetic theory that things are beautiful which are functioning correctly, well, you're presupposing that function is primary. And he didn't say this, but some people have said things like this, that, that function is the primary thing, and you end up with brutalist architecture and just grossness. I don't, I don't think that's the case. I think brutalist architecture is the product of a malformed person um sometimes beauty is the function period or ornament is the function um mm -hmm. yeah but well, it's, cer it's for certainly me, go yeah. ahead it's certainly not in a candle uh but it might be in a or it might be that um overt beauty uh, serves the end of certain things like cathedrals or uh, portraits. Yeah. So for me, it, it's it's okay. So there's a metaphysical structure to this. There is um, to talk of a function of a human being. Well, what is the function? So eventually, for Aristotle, the function of the human being is contemplation of the good of the first cause. Uh, that's what humans are for. Mm -hmm. That would be the most beautiful. And it's completely useless. It transcends use. It's not a use case. You know, it's just contemplation. All sorts of things that get you there are functional because they serve the function at the end. If there's no function for the end, there's no function. There's no uh, mediate function. You know what I mean? Um, if you don't care if you win, then there's no function to the parts of your army. But then, so Thomas says somewhere that beauty is that which delights when seen. And the delight, I think, is probably more than just its function. <sighs> so you look at the candle, it's, oh gosh, what a well-functioning candle, that's brilliant, it's so beautiful. <sighs> yeah, but I think there's more to it. Yeah, well, if if delight is the purpose or the metric, there there is no delight without the beholder. Mm -hmm. So there's something about there be the beholder that that is involved in this beauty thing. Well, and if you are a well formed beholder, you're going to see if you if you've read these lectures which you ought to, you will be able, I think, to delight more in a candle. I would, I would think. But what about your brutalist architecture? <sighs> they, mis they, they mistake the function. They, they're not places that are conducive for contemplation. But their you know, function... They're bad for you. Their function is to harm people, though. Yeah. Yeah. So they, they, they do what they're supposed to do pretty well. You walk into the state of Illinois building and you're overwhelmed by the ugliness of it, which is appropriate when you're dealing with uh, <laughs> the state government of Illinois. At the University of Oklahoma, where I went to school for a minute, um, they have a bunch of buildings that were built you know, between like 1898 and about 1920. And they're brick and some of, they have some wood floors and they creak and uh, they look like university buildings. They're what they're, they're what they ought to be. You know, they have transoms above the doors and the, you know, and mm -hmm. well, they, hell they did. They're probably torn them all down now. You know, I don't know, 
But there's a building there, the the, the physical sciences building, uh, where they have the chemistry and physics lectures are and chemistry and physics labs are. Brutalist. Brutalist. You know what the kids call the building? They call it the blender. <laughs> it has a big square base, and then it has a smaller rectangular tower that sits on top of it, and it looks like a blender. But it is also a grinding, horrific piece of shit to look at and to go into and to be a part of. They call it the yeah. blender. <laughs> yeah, I had to take uh, one of mine on some college trips, and uh, I will not disclose. But the one that she finally picked when she wanted to go, she decided she wanted to go. It, it uh, you know, we went, we visited one of the state schools around here, and then we visited the other one, another one, and it it was more collegey. You know it. The one she picked is more college Well, it, it's, yeah, it, yeah. It's, it's more like uh, an old worn building that lots of people have gone through and have sat and listened and learned in, and it's not, you know, some architect's idea of an optimal space. Right. It's a space dictated more like, like the candle, the shape of the candle is dictated by uh, the materials that go into it. It's got to be a certain shape. You can't have a rectangular candle. It'll be a lousy candle. Because you have uh, the distances between the material and the heat source are all wrong. Well, you have uh, your, the matter would be the young students, and what you're doing is making a lecture hall where you can talk and discuss. And so the buildings and the halls are shaped in the appropriate way for that to happen. Um, and they're they're beautiful, and I, I, the modern stuff is not as much where they're shaped more for. Because I, I saw some of this happening. The new buildings, they're shaped more for the technology. You know, you have a huge TV screen, a huge monitor. Right. Um, and it's set up for you to present them visual images on a screen. The room, not necessarily for you to talk. And, and the rooms are modular. They'll have like folding dividers here and yawn. And then uh, if there are risers, those risers can sometimes fold up. And they just... and, and uh, you know, one of my favorite Twitter personalities is Wrath of Non. Mm -hmm. G-N-O-N. And, and Wrath of Non writes about, I don't know, uh, vernacular architecture and like livable urban planning and s stuff. And, you know, he, he stuff said... Stuff you ought to care about. Stuff you ought to care about. And, uh, you know, he, sa he says that you need to build, you need to build in the vernacular. You need to build with what's around there. You know, if you want the building to last, you need to build with what's around the building because that's what you'll have available to repair it. But it also means that when you build with materials that are around the building, that the color palettes match. The colors match. The textures match. Everything's right. You know, if, if the candle can form a cup of molten fuel because of this precarious balance between the melting and freezing point of the wax and the dance of the flame at the end of the wick. If there's a, if there's a miraculous coincidence that makes the candle work, there's also a miraculous coincidence that makes vernacular building materials work in a lot of ways. And the more, the more engineered products that we have and the more um, prefabricated projects, products we have, the farther we get away from that aesthetic experience of having a building and the more it becomes an economic proposition solely. And uh, that's yeah. not what this book's about, but maybe it is what it's about. Yep. It's a, let, let me read something to you. Um, in my, in the Dover edition, it's page 21, which is a facsimile edition. So dear listener, uh, it might be your page number two. We come here, after talking a bit about the candle, we come here to be philosophers. And I hope you will always remember that whenever a result happens, especially if it be new, you should say, what is the cause? Why does it occur? And you will, in the course of time, find out the reason. What does he mean by philosopher? Why doesn't he say scientist? He loves knowledge, man. Well, why not? Science means the knower. We are knowers here. You yep. say, we are scientists. Sci scientist comes from the Latin word to know. Philosophy comes from the Greek word 
Greek words meaning lover of wisdom. You know, he, he's, he's loving, he's not, no. I mean, it's, it, it's about his object, it's not about him. It's about right. the object. Right, and if you already knew, you wouldn't have any questions. You know, if you trust the science, you don't have any questions. If you are a philosopher, you say, well, what is the cause of this? You're always trying to work up to prior causes, which is what philosophy is, or at least is what metaphysics is. What page are you on? I'm on page 21 and 22 okay. of my edition. Uh, I thought it was cool. The, um, I mean, I'm, I don't suppose on the podcast we're going to go through all of the science of the candle, which you can do for yourself. I'm, I'm pointing out cool and interesting things. I thought it was funny. Uh, he says... So how does the flame get hold of the fuel? So the wick, we're not burning the wick. The wick burns, but that's beside the point. It doesn't have to burn. If you could keep the fuel supply constant, it wouldn't, which is what a lamp is. You don't, the, in a lamp, the wick doesn't burn. The fuel burns. Eventually, you have to replace the wick. Yeah. But, um, for the most part, it's not burning. The, the molten wax that is at the end of the wick is what's burning. Well, how does it get there? And he says this, and I thought this was funny. He says, uh, there's a beautiful point about that. Capillary attraction. Capillary attraction, you say. The attraction of hairs. Well, he's able to say that because all of the kids in his school know enough Latin to know that capilla means hair. Yep. So he just has this passing remark about that, and then they go on to talk about examples of capillary attraction. Just presume they all know the, enough Latin to know that. Yeah. Phonics, phonics is what we use to take the chunks of a word apart and then figure out how to sound it out. Latin is what you use to take the chunks of the word and sound out the meaning. Mm, yeah. That's good. That's good. Uh, Latin's really good for that. Uh, yeah. We have... By the way, at Online Great Books, which you could join by going to onlinegreatbooks.com, mm. I don't know, and sign up for slash podcast and yeah. get on the waiting list. Uh, we have some people that are reasonably active teaching themselves Latin and Greek, which is what gentlemen used to know as a prerequisite. I saw the Harvard entrance exam from about 1890, and I know some... I know a little bit more Latin than I know Greek, and I don't know enough of either of them. And these were involved Greek questions on this test, which yeah. was just to get into college. Whew. Yeah, uh, that test is unfair. It, <laughs> well, no, not everybody, very few people would have gone to college in those days. And the ones that would were expected to know a whole lot of stuff. It doesn't mean that everybody knew Greek and Latin more than now. But um, it wasn't a – colleges nowadays seem like a jobs program or a – Maybe. It, it, something. You know, everybody needs to go to college. Why? Why does everyone need to go to college? Well, for the experience, I don't know. I don't know. Yeah, whatever. <laughs> Capital action, you might say. The traction of hairs. And he says, well, never mind the name. It was given in old times before we had a good understanding of what the real power was. Well, by the time Faraday gets hold of it, they know that there's a surface tension that causes the, mm -hmm. uh, uh, the, 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 the fluid to move up, you know, these narrow confines. The surface tension allows them to defy gravity. He, he, later on, he talks about hydrogen. Hydrogen. Mm -hmm. you know, born he, of water. Born of water. He says, you know, he, 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 yeah, he spells this out, you know. I, I love those little, you know, I've got a little, tiny, tiniest little bit of Latin, and I'll, I'll see those things from time to time, and they make, they make the world make more sense to me. Or when mm -hmm. somebody, some professional person, like, I don't mean like, what's that three-named guy that's now the science guy? Neil deGrasse Tyson? You know, he's not a professional. He's a he's a carny. He's a he's a he's a fucking science carny. 
I do not like. No, nor do I. But 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 Faraday's a pro, and by pro, I don't mean like his demeanor or that he gets paid to do it. Like this is what he does every day. This is his craft. So when somebody like him has an insight about one of these words, I don't know, it just delights me. It's just a delight to me. Have you seen the OED now that they've redone it? The online read OED on for a while. They completely fuck sword this website. Completely ruined it. It barely works. Many things are a jobs program. You know, we ha- we have a web designer. He needs to do something. Have to change it. So, uh, Lavoisier named oxygen, apparently. Born of, and I don't know what the root is. Um, and he, he said, uh, according to the um, OED here, um, he was intending for it to mean acidifying principle. Hmm. But he's saying O-X-Y-G-I-N-E. So it's been anglicized to match hydrogen, I guess. Yeah. Um, Before then, it was known as Lair de Phlogistici. Phlogistic? The phlogistic air. Yeah. <laughs> I love all that, that old, old, yeah, you have to quasi alchemy make sure you have a, a, you have to have a sufficient supply of phlogiston uh so i learned some stuff i learned that flame uh comes from the little bits of soot in the air yeah i have questions I about this, this carl Yes. So he 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 wants to know where well well the first investigate well first of all his first investigation is to just hold the thing and roll it around in his hands and look at it and then he catches one uh, you know he he lights a wick and he watches it and we he can actually skip this experiment because everybody's done this they know what a candle looks like so he goes into the form and then he talks about the pool of wax at the top the cup he calls it and then he says gosh how does the flame even work. And then he says, then he then he does a little a little work with capillary action. And then he says, but how can we why can we see the flame? And I think he actually says something about an alcohol flame, you can't see it. I believe that mm-hmm. he says something like that. But he's like, how can we see this? And he says that we can only see the flames when solids are heated. Yeah. I don't think that that's true. You know, we excite gases and have neon lights. We, um, you know, we have, I don't know about an LED, you know, um, is there, are they heated or are they just excited? Uh, they're excited at a low... Weird things uh, happen in those diodes. Yeah. In a, electrons are good a, things. If an electron is excited and a photon's emitted or whatever. Um so some of these things, I think the modern the modern um, bug man would just poo poo it. He'd say that's simply not true. Actually, I mean, I caught myself yeah, I, doing it. I caught myself saying, "Mike, some shit lights up that doesn't isn't solid." Well, the alcohol flame, there is a flame. There is a flame, but it doesn't emit uh, the photons. Well, it doesn't have soot in it. It burns clean. Um, so you couldn't what I you couldn't have flame be solely the heating up of solid particles. Doesn't mean he's wrong about the candle. No, he's not wrong about the candle. But but he but where is it? Am I going to go find it? Uh, where he where he says that you know that that this actually comes from. Brightness of the flame, products of combustion. Um, hell, I don't know where it is. But but he he essentially says, you know, it's it's a solid that's being heated that it, that's causing the light. You know, he heats a wire, he heats a metal screen, he you know he heats some things up that then give off a light, and then he and he, and then uh, eventually he gets a little bit of carbon and he heats that up and makes some light. 
Um, he, he has Carl. He yes. has he has right opinion, but he does not have true knowledge here. Have you researched this further to see what the modern consensus is on the candle flame? Uh, no, I think that they would say. I mean, uh, my uh, twenty. Oh, golly, my twenty-seven-year-old chemistry minor says that you know that that certain elements, when excited, will emit photons. Carbon is definitely one of those. You know, there were carbon arc lights and um, and lime. They would excite lime with heat in light theaters, and you know. So th- this is that th- that is the understanding. The but origin it of limelight. That's right. But it doesn't have to be a solid, is what I'm saying. His understanding at that time was that it had to be a solid. Uh, Gases can be excited and they emit photons. You know, whatever. I want to point something out on 33 in my book. So he's playing around with, um, I don't know, it's like cotton on a stick or something. Spirit of wine. A little spirit flame. He says, I have here a flame. It is not a candle flame, but you can, no doubt, by this time, generalize enough to be able to compare one thing with another. Uh Uh-oh. Modern people can't fucking do that. Oh, oh, I I know a lady who's six foot two. Women are generally shorter than men. (laughs) Well, actually, I know... Yeah. Uh, <clears throat> yes, there are many such cases <laughs> of uh, the inability to generalize, and uh, he's he's presuming that these young kids, I don't know if there are any girls, there probably weren't, um, are able to generalize from one thing to another, which is the th- you have to get the universal, you have to be able to get the universal from differing situations, or you cannot get knowledge. All you could ever get would be opinion, probably not even that. Yeah, and just reacting to stimuli. So, so I mean, griping about that isn't me just griping about people these days. Like we're losing the the foundations of thought that allow us to do these kinds of investigations. <clears throat> yeah, did you look up Snapdragon? <laughs> I didn't. I, I, I well, I did. I did enough to figure out what it was. Uh, let's see here. Where is it? Where is it? He says. Uh, uh, So these are children's lectures. He's doing these lectures for children. He says, Am I right in supposing that anybody here has played at Snapdragon? I do not know a more beautiful illustration of the philosophy of flame as to a certain part of its history than the game of Snapdragon. First, here's the dish. And let me say that when you play Snapdragon properly, you ought to have the dish well warmed. You ought also to have warm plums and warm brandy, which, however, I have not got. When you have put the spirit into the dish, you have the cup and the fuel. See, he's, he's drawing a car- parallel back to his candle. And are not the raisins acting like the wicks? And I now throw the plums into the dish and light the spirit. And you see those beautiful tongues of flame which I refer to? You have air creeping in over the edge of the dish forming these tongues. Why? Because through the force of the current and irregularity of the action of flame, it can now not flow in one uniform stream. Blah, blah, blah. So he's talking about this game, Snapdragon, where uh, you put raisins and plums in a dish of liquor, and then you light it on fire, and the kids yep. are essentially bobbing for burning apples. <laughs> yep. I think they grab it with their hands. They grab it with their hands. They're grabbing I, I do that. raisins and plums floating in a burning dish of brandy, typically. <laughs> in a house made of wood. <laughs> uh, for Christmas. Your ancestors were different than you are. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. I, I, I've got it. <laughs> you know, the thing is, you, can you even get spiritus liquor hot, uh, high enough proof that you can light it on fire? Oh, for sure. How high does it have to be? I mean, usually what you buy is only uh, 80, 80%. No, no, 40%. 80 proof, 40 per- Yeah, I don't, I don't know. You get 100 proof, it'll light. Hmm. I would Maybe think. I just haven't done it right. Are you challenging me? Myself. 
<laughs> to, to a game to of set up a game of Snapdragon. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, I mean, if you have the the calloused hands of the homesteader, which you have, you'd be able to just reach your hand right in there and just pull them all out. And the delicate handed children, you, you won't even you won't even notice that it's on fire. Let's see, minimum. See, I'm going to get a bullshit. I'm going to get a bullshit response from the search engine because it already knows who I am. Minimum proof for, uh, I don't know, to light on fire. Yeah, alcohol is very flammable, and anything over 80 proof will light on fire. Absinthe can range from about 45 to 75. Hmm? Some sources say that uh, fires only start around 57%, 114 proof. That's pretty hot. It's pretty hot. Lecture two, where does the candle go? So the candle gets shorter the older it gets. There's some old riddle about that. Uh, I can't remember the riddle, but it was something about something aging and shrinking. Mm. And it's a candle. Redheaded, aged. It's taller. I mean, gets shorter as time goes by. So something's happening. So, you know, you don't know. You come in and you think you know what a candle is. Well, no, just observe it. See what it does. Ask the questions. What's going on? Something that was there is no longer there. Where did it go? Mm -hmm. I don't see any ash. I know about fires, but we have to clean the ash away. Where's the ash? Uh, he does a few things. He, well, the thing that I like to, I, I want to try is, uh, if you, t if you put a, probably you want to do this with a metal tube, but if you put a, like a steel straw into your candle, you can light the other end of it. Yes. Which I now want to do. Yeah, so he, he takes a, a piece of gla drawn glass tubing and he inserts the end of it, one end of it, into the flame. And of course, there's not a, it, that will burn in the candle momentarily, but there's not enough oxygen in the, in the tube uh, to keep it burning. Um, and then that, that vapor that he pulls off, actually, he doesn't know what it is yet. We don't know what it is yet. Um, whatever that is, those fluxions, that, that, that phlogiston uh, moves up the tube and then you can light it at the other end of the tube. And, and it's you get a, something that looks like a candle flame. And it looks like a candle flame. And the tube is glass, so you can see in there and you can see that they're, it's colorless and, I mean, it's invisible. It's, there are pixies in the tube, apparently. It is a, a something they call a vapor. Mm -hmm. It is vaporous. We find that this is the wax of the candle made into a vaporous fluid, not a gas. And I like his little parentheses. You must learn the difference between a gas and a vapor. A gas remains permanent. A vapor is something that will condense. Yes. Okay, thank you, Mr. Faraday. I will attempt to be more precise. It's water vapor because normally on planet Earth it will condense. It is oxygen gas because the oxygen is not going to condense on planet earth yeah and solidification is different than just than condensation it's it's different in because uh, they, they they're both the same thing but the condensation happens in normal atmospheric conditions here on earth there you go yeah he's a chemistry minor i I never went to my chemistry class. Well, I mean, that's not what the chemistry text would say. They would poo-poo a lot of this. You know, I, 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 would, I would take these stupid science classes, and they would talk about Davy or Faraday or Boyle, and then they would find something like this that was a, a, straight, you know, a little distinction that we've now seen doesn't hold, maybe. And they'd say, well, mm -hmm. actually, if you've got a, you know, if you got a vacuum pump, you know, you can get things to vaporize, or you can, you know, pump, sublimate. You can 
uh, you can pressure it up and get them to condense at regular temperatures. And, you know, and then they talk about, well, st STP, standard temperature and pressure conditions, and blah, blah, blah. They put all these qualifiers on it, and they act like these guys have been um, surpassed or debunked or something, and it's just <laughs> not true. That is the word I hate. That's one of my – I hate that word. Debunked. Debunked. Yeah, it is. It's too. a trigger, which means I don't need to pay attention to whatever this person said ever. Right. Well, that's been debunked. And it's always in the passive. It's not John Smith debunked it. Right. I just debunked So that I could go look it up and see what did he actually say. No, it has been debunked. The gods have said it, it, it is. Uh, Everything is rhetoric. <sighs> yeah. What I did not know is uh, where the hottest parts of the flame are. Mm. I should have known, but um, I'm not so smart. But that there is a zone of heat. There is a spot that is hotter than the other spots, and the hottest spot is on the outside of the flame. And it's a very cool way, which I'll probably try next time I have a stable flame, uh, is you take paper and you put it right in the flame, and you'll find out that it burns a lot on the outside of the flame and not as much in the middle. In other words, that it is hotter where there is oxygen, which he doesn't know about yet, combustible air uh, on the outside of the flame. That's where the combustion is happening, which is mostly. Yeah, um, when you go to welding school, you spend a little bit of time on this uh, in terms of your cutting torch. You know, where, yeah. you know, where, where do you hold that flame on the workpiece um, to get the result you want with the lowest fuel cost and et cetera? Yeah, so uh, spend quite a bit of time adjusting that flame by hand, learning how to adjust that flame by hand, and then, um, you know, put it on the workpiece, you know, right where you want it, where the, where the max heat's being delivered per fuel and oxygen. Pretty neat. But those guys are mm -hmm. done, you know? They, those guys are dumb. What, welders? Yeah. We're dumb. Yeah, morons. Well, they didn't go to college. Right. Uh, so, I must not know anything. Um, the fresh air, I don't know. That that was one of the things that I learned that I didn't know. I should have known it, but I didn't. His This argument about solid particles in the flame... He does some, he's not, this is not a silly argument, whether it's ultimately completely true or not. He, he does other kinds of, he lights other things on fire that don't produce carbon. Right. He lights iron filings on fire and uh, I think they get very luminous, but they don't, there's no flame coming out from them. Yeah, so he's generalizing, he's, you know, he sees... Iron filings are more like what we might call, I don't know, a spark, maybe? And he, he makes some observations about how those things burn and then infers from that that there must be something like the iron filing in the candle vapor that causes that to be luminous. Later on, he burns some iron in pure oxygen mm -hmm. and figures out something more about, about these solids, exciting solids to make photons. And there's a very good word you should know, uh, effulgence. Effulgence, yeah. The effulgence of the carbon. Well, I don't know that he's entirely wrong. So if you look at the flame, the, where is the brightest part of the flame? It's, it's not at the spot where you would have the most combustion, which would be at the bottom and maybe the edges. It's in the middle where it is further from the fresh air and would have less uh, complete oxidation of the things you're burning. Am I, am I wrong? No. But meanwhile, he's doing all this for kids. He's showing them 
you know, he's playing with fire, which is the greatest thing ever. And uh, showing them things that they could have observed on their own at their kitchen table every day. Hmm. So it's, it's like a model of a philosopher. And I love that he calls himself that. Nobody does that anymore. I don't know when they stopped. Yeah. When did it stop being natural philosophy? I don't know. And become science. Probably, probably right at 1900. It's a big problem. You know, these words mean things. Well, it's, a, it's as they say, a paradigm shift. You know, when, when, uh, when understanding the chemical processes in a candle flame and um, ethics and a study of ethics share the same name, you know, you're going to get a little bit of a different uh, response Ooh, from, a good point. from those people than you would uh, mm, scientists. You know, science, I don't know, is method- methodological. You know, it's about, uh, in my opinion anyway, a scientist is somebody who does a process. Scientific method. Mm-hmm. They investigate in a certain way. And, well, and, yeah. and, and, it, and it, it makes no other claims about anything. The natural philosopher, just the name of that, has entirely different connotations and, and carries claims with it. And by the way, he's not using the scientific method. There, there's no control group. He's just, he's just observing and tinkering. He's being an engineer, which is the proper way to understand the world. <gasps> I, I, I would say he's being a philosopher. Uh, he's observing more than he's holding nature to account through a, a, a method. I agree with that. The, I, um, I, I agree with that. And, and that's what the engineer does. Th- that's not, a, you know... You know, running solid works and you know cre- creating stress models and things on a computer. You know, but you know, real engineering. You know, Isambard Kingdom Brunel type engineering. The uh, I, I think probably that that distinction between a philosopher and a scientist is, I think, is probably pretty important. I think um, I could come up with sinister reasons for it. Uh, ethics is part of philosophy. Science, uh, Faraday is doing what he thinks is philosophy. It, it, they're all under nature. So they're all ultimately one thing. They're all about one thing. You are a part of nature yourself. So the ethics determining how you ought to act is a part of nature. Well, no, if we, if we divide it from science, we break off science, this, uh, you know, peer, whatever science is, peer reviewed stuff. Um, Ethics is entirely unrelated. And so, you know, this is, this is Sartre. Um, oh, boy. Existence precedes essence. You can be whatever you want to be. Uh, the determination of the human person or the candle or whatever has nothing to do with what you ought to do with the human person or the candle. Um, so I, I think it's probably insidious and I, I need to track down when it started to being, when it started being used and it would be cool if any of these colleges that aren't totally gone changed their science department to the department of natural philosophy. They, they won't do it. You know, there's this, I, I've, I've told you this before. I, I've told, I've said this on this show before. I took a class called the history of science at the university of Oklahoma there is a history of science department at the University of Oklahoma. They have a r- rare books collection full of like original Galileo stuff and these original science texts. And they take pride in this, whatever, this department and this study that they do. But they, they treated this like archaeology and and they 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 were progr- they were basically progressive and sneered at all of it. 
Well, you know, Aristotle, you know, he says rocks want to be on the ground. He's so silly, and we know better now because we know it's 9.8 meters per second squared. They don't know fucking anything about gravity. We don't know anything they, more about it than Aristotle did. They don't. All they know is the they have a, a watch so they can determine the rate at which the rock wants to be on the ground. They know the rate. They cannot tell you why it wants to be on the ground. And if you say it wants to be... You know, it's drawn to the center of mass of the rock earth complex. It doesn't add to the understanding, actually. It, it actually doesn't under, add to the understanding. But they sneered at all of it. You know, so even when they were, I remember it. I mean, it would, it, it turned my stomach then. I would fist fight the guy now. Like I would come out of the desk and whip his ass now. I remember his name. His name was Taylor. And, uh, well, that's how you knew. Right, and th- they could never, but b- b- you know, bow themselves to call you know what they do, um, you know, natural philosophy. You know, they wear a lab what? coat like a priest. You know, they have like a uniform. You know, it's like a new religion. You know, and the scientists—that's the priest cla- priestly class—and they're Gnostic, and they know all the secrets. And three name science guy, you know, comes on to David Letterman and makes proclamations about it's it's crazy. Uh, for me, history of science, uh, okay. So, this is what book is this from? I think it's Edmund Husserl, something about geometry. Uh, you don't need to bother reading him, he's very very hard to get into but he's trying to say that what you really want to do is recover the original insight and i think um i think that's what you ought to do i mean faraday he's he's telling you exactly how they figured this out which is you know these are giants giants once walked upon the earth and figured these things out faraday is a giant and, and you ought to if you're going to study them You know, if you just want to know what the products of combustion of a candle are, you can look it up in a handbook. Big deal. But what is better is to try to reenact the thought process to jump into that big insight that they had. And Husserl does this when he's talking about geometry. The way that you do geometry ideally is you're trying to recover whoever it was, Euclid. Euclid at least wrote it down. Whoever it was that figured these things out. And you have the same flash of insight that they did. And you're not sitting there th- saying, well, actually, Euclid, there are, there are non-Euclidean spaces. Yeah, sh- sure there are. But you, you're, not, you're, not gamma, you're not being a gamma. <laughs> you're saying, uh, Newton, you know? I have Newton. I have the Principia. I've only read about three pages of it. But the, 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 the big thing for me was just... His word for momentum, mass times uh, velocity, quantity of motion. I'd never thought of it that way. It's, it's this big insight. Oh, well, of course now. You know, he, right. Whatever motion is, can I quantify it? And the word momentum that gets taught, no, I, that, that raises all kinds of things for me. And I got that from reading Newton stuff. And trying to think along with him. It'll make you smarter. You know, you can get your little handbook and get all the facts that you want to to build your stuff, but better off uh, trying to recover some of this. And a history of science ought to be uh, more of that. You know, how did he come up with it? What was the thought process that led to it? What were his categories of thought going into it? You know, um, I think that'd be much better. This this guy's name is Kenneth Taylor. This is the professor I'm talking about. Um, he, he he's professor emeritus there. Oh, you whatever. And it'd be interesting to talk to the guy. I think that he is probably reverent towards Copernicus and Aristotle and Faraday. So I don't want to I don't want to deuce on him too much. 
but it, it was always there. It was always there in all the lectures and all the books and everything that we've moved on from this. You know, I said he was sneering. That's not fair. I don't think he was sneering. But it was always there that, that we were standing on their shoulders. And that sounds good, but it's not. You're stomping them. It's not hmm. good. And, you know, th th I've got the great books of the Western world set from Encyclopedia Britannica here behind me. I'm going to look at it. It has uh, volume 10, Euclid, Arch Archimedes, and uh, Nicomachus. Uh, that's uh, some stuff on arithmetic. Um, then you got here uh, number 15, Ptolemy, Copernicus, and Kepler. Um, Newton's in here, I believe. Um, I can't read them all. I don't have my glasses. Here's Lavoisier, Berkeley, uh, Lavoisier. Anyway, there's the scientific stuff in here. And uh, why the hell we read it? You know, one of my one of my dear friends is uh, an engineer, does an electrical engineering doctorate and stuff. You know, we were talking about Newton, and he's like, "Oh, it's so hard." Like the you know modern ca calculus texts um, are so much easier to learn calculus from. Mm -hmm. <sighs> yeah, maybe. Well, are you learning calculus? Is the question. You're learning a you are incantation. Yeah, you're learning. Uh, what do I do when I have the integral of sine x dx over, you know, some interval? I know how to do that, but do I know what I'm doing? That's there's a difference between. Uh, doing what a trained monkey could do and producing the right result or doing what any of these AI models could do and actually, at least I believe there's a difference, and actually having an intuition about the thing itself. The thing in this case being the sine function hmm. and how it relates to um, adding up the area under the curve and how you figure that out. Or even that you can, you know, it, it's... Calculus is odd. It's black magic. You know, you're adding up infinite, infinitely small things that don't exist. Yeah, it's crazy. Uh, and having infinite series is con converge to a finite number. Very strange. Very strange, especially when you but just, realize infinities don't exist, you know. <laughs> yeah, none of it exists. Uh, and yet it comes up with amazing results. Well, struggling through, and I haven't done this, but struggling through Newton on calculus, I've heard that Leibniz is better on calculus, but struggling through that stuff. Newton's already. It, it's not without use. We generally, you know, at o OGB, we don't really do it. We have run Euclid seminars and some math stuff. We've had some people do it. Um, part of that is, I think if you wanted to do the science in the way that it ought to be done, I. I I recall they do this at Thomas Aquinas College. You have a lab mm -hmm. for the science texts. And you're trying to reproduce some of the insights that they had. So, you know, you're actually, I don't think they read Faraday, but if they did, you know, you would do this with a candle, with the tubes, everything else. You would read it and you would do it and try to recover what they originally got so that you're not relying on a textbook to tell you what the case is. You've actually figured it out yourself. A um, little hard to do when we're meeting once a month for two hours. Yeah. A little tricky. Carl? Yes? Lecture three. Oh, about three paragraphs in, maybe four. He's got a big, long paragraph there. And he says, he's talking about water. Because he, he finally, he... By and by, he elucidates here that the combustion products of of um, of this are CO two and water, water vapor. Mm -hmm. He gets there. It's amazing, actually. I think. Uh, but he but we're at the water part, and he says water is one individual thing. It never changes. Yes, it's an individual thing. I think that's a concept that we're losing. 
discuss? <laughs> well, there's a it's an individual thing. It never changes. It means it's something that is um, able to be investigated. It's a stable thing. It is a, a natural type. Uh oh. Uh, it's there's a form of water. Yeah, it's a natural that, type, and it never changes. And as such, it can be investigated. And because it doesn't change, it's worth investigating because your findings will hold. But I don't know, man. Like the idea that things are individual, immutable things is things are immutable, unchangeable uh-huh. things. That that we're, we're that's getting to be slippery, man. Loose and slippery, well, a, like Hume says. It's a it's a presupposition for the possibility of natural philosophy. That there is something there to be investigated. What am I even talking about? If I'm doing uh, a study of candles, there has to be such a thing as a candle. There has to be such a thing as the, the products of combustion. You know, there has to be stuff. And some, I'm sure somebody's like, well, of course there are. Well, no, I mean, the, the conventional wisdom is things aren't real. I can make things whatever I want them to be. Just by believing so. Well, if if that's the case, you'll never do any natural philosophy. You know, you're you're stuck with you're stuck under the veil of Maya. You know, you're never going to get any anywhere. It, it's, there are things they can be investigated. They have properties. Uh, they endure. That might lead you to tricky questions like, well, why are there things? Uh oh. Why do they endure? Why is it that water is the same way always? If I can find these chemical properties today from this candle, are they going to be true tomorrow? What about you know what about what about isms killing us? Uh, and people will say, well, you know you've seen it. I used to make this point. I would stand up in class with a, with a pen and I'd say, what happens when I let this go? It's going to fall. How do you know that? Um, Because it has fallen? Well, I didn't ask you if it has fallen. I asked you if it's going to fall. I wish you to extend your knowledge into the future case. You have not seen the future. You do not know what's going to happen in the future unless you have a hidden premise. Mm. What's the hidden premise? That there is immutable stuff right there are natural types there is an order to the universe an enduring order which leads to then i can ask you difficult and probably unsolvable questions why is there an order to the universe and now you're a philosopher (laughs) contemplating first causes yeah and if you don't you have to do you you have to do and if you don't (sighs) Everything uh, becomes mutable, not immutable. Dude. I learned something. I learned uh, on page 68 of the Dover edition. A pint of oil, when burnt fairly and properly, produces rather more than a pint of water. Hmm. Stoichiometrics. I, I, I thought that was pretty neat. I hadn't really thought about that. I... The quantities seem weird. Now, if I just had that fact, I'd have to sit and think, well, what, what's going on here? As Faraday says, I invite you to philosophize. He says something. He says, like, what, ice floats. Water, when it freezes, floats. And I invite you now to philosophize. Yeah, why why does be? it float? And you have to think, well, it must get bigger. It is less dense than it, it was before. Less dense, yeah. Uh, or, or what's going on when I burn a pint of oil in my lamp? If I collect all of the condensation from the flame, I'm going to end up with more water than I had oil. Well, I have to think. Oh, I'm not just so oil is dense water. <laughs> no. Oh. Uh, I don't think so. I don't know. I mean, if the water weighs, does the water weigh more than the oil? Well, yeah, because water, everybody knows oil floats on top of water. 
Okay, so you're getting more mass out of the fire than you had going into it. That's fascinating to me. Which means, in the flame, you mm. are combining something with the the oil out of, well, the phlogiston, out the, of the, the air. The, <laughs> and uh, the phlogiston. that's pretty cool. Yeah. He fills a cast iron vessel with water, caps it tightly, freezes it, and he explodes it. Yeah. Take that, Bill Nye. Take that, three name. Uh, Pluto is not a planet, you know, because Neil deGrasse Tyson right. said so. Oh, so you've heard you've heard folks that say uh, uh, that Helen Keller was a scam, yes? Uh, I've heard you say that. Well, I've been hearing more people say this on on the interwebs. Like she's supposedly deaf, but you like. You know, you can dance your fingers around in her hand, and she then she like understands Marxism, and then uh, she's deaf, but she has like an English accent. There were accent. a few steps in between there. What what, what the fuck Allegedly. were they? I mean, <laughs> I mean seriously, what were they? Uh, that she and what's her name Sullivan were able to communicate and teach her language through um, with one sense. Well, I mean, she could taste and she could smell, maybe. For feeling, yeah. Yeah, rubbish. She, and, she, and then she has an English accent. Well, I don't know. Did she ever talk? Yes. Oh, I didn't know that. Yeah, yeah it's just utter rubbish. Utter rubbish. You know what else is rubbish? Stephen Hawking. Utter <laughs> rubbish. They, they cart this veggie out there and then act like he's profound and then claim that there are black holes that like destroy information and it's just because you know w wizard vegetable said so and then they'll have an interpreter stand there like it's some sort of a like it's some sort of charismatic church you know and he like grunts and then she interprets him speaking in tongues and then you know says all the it's it's outrageous it's the cr one of the craziest psyops ever perpetrated unbelievable Um, but, but, uh, no, uh -uh, rubbish. Well, if you have people who, who dig Stephen Hawking, you say, well, what, what was his scientific contribution? What did he come up with? Oh, I don't know. Einstein, what did he come up with? General and special theories of relativity. Okay, Hawking, what did he come up with? Uh, he did some work on time, I think. He did some work about, on, you know, some math about black holes, supposedly. But we don't know what he did. Like, you know, he was, he was locked in a decaying body for the last 20 years, or if, if he was, if there was even anything there. He's like, what's his name, Nancy Chavo or whatever it was. That's basically what he was. Like, we should have taken her. We should have gone there to, there to Florida when they had the feeding tube in her. What was her name? You remember? Her name was, her name was Terry. Terry Chavo. That's it. We should have went down there and Michael. propped her up in a motorized chair, and then I would have walked around with her, and like I and I would have told everybody I was her aide, and I would have just said that she had like you know a divine line on physics, and I could have just proclaimed all kinds of you know truths about you know subatomic physics and you know the origins of the universe, and I would say, well, you know, she it came from her. Yeah, I, I and we could have been on I, Nova. You know, I remember that show. Yeah, David Suzuki could have like interviewed her, but I would have answered. You know, of course, the CIA would tell me what to say. You know, it would be awesome. I, I am uh, enamored of very many conspiracy theories. I haven't gone very deep on the Stephen Hawking. I haven't either, uh, but like I know, just was never real impressed. I read one of his books. It was I, I read a brief history of time. I was like, what? You know, it, this was a book that everyone bought to have on their shelf. Right. Oh, you read Stephen Hawking. Right. But it wasn't particularly insightful. You, you know, the, the world has clamored. They clamored before and they have clamored since for another, you know, nihilist, you know, Carl Sagan. You know, Carl Sagan had a way of making people feel good about feeling awful. 
and and we've been looking for that guy again ever since and haven't found him. It's Neil. It's Neil deGrasse Tyson. He doesn't have near the. I mean, he's at DeGrasse or DeGrassi. Near DeGrassi Tyson. <laughs> I don't that, know. Wasn't that a Canadian show about high school DeGrassi High or something? I don't. I don't know about Canada. I don't think Canada exists either. Don't get me started about that. I've been there allegedly I twice. Don't, I don't think you were. I think you were in North North Minnesota. <laughs> uh. What was I going to say about? Oh, yeah, T- D- DeGrasse Tyson is a carny. He doesn't have like the sort of seriousness and gravitas that that Sagan had, you know. And Sagan got got his job by writing and working. I, uh, T- Carl Sagan. Uh, I hate him. I don't. The pale blue I, dot. No, and, I. I think at least he had. Billions. I, and gosh, I loved billions. that show Cosmos when I was a kid. It's a wonder I grew out of it. Yeah. I, oh, I did uh, too. I loved the books. Yeah, it, it's a. Uh, gosh, that show would come on. My mom would make these little pizza things for us, and I'd sit and watch it. Because uh, it was science, right? And it had decent production values and, and uh, a fundamentally wrong view of history. But I don't think. Uh, I don't think Sagan's nihilism was entirely cheerful. I think there was a bit of the tragic to it. Um, That's true. When I read what he he wrote, which you you don't, you know, if you're going to think that God is dead, you need to know that it's a big deal. I don't think Tyson DeGrasse Tyson knows or cares. No, or no. considers that anything is to be lost, or that he's sawn off the branch that he's sitting on. Um. So uh, Sagan, I could deal with Tyson. I, man, he has the worst Twitter feed. I, I, I it's can't. all just it's all just snarky. Yeah, I, actually, yeah. I read the uh, the Dragons of Eden. We had a, that would that might be fun. Carl Sagan wrote about his idea, of like the evolutionary uh, origin of human intelligence. It's all right, uh, but he. You know he's, yeah he's he's a mess. <laughs> he's a mess. Do you, do you remember um, uh, what's his name, uh, Bernowski? Um, Context. Oh, it was another. There was another television series similar to Cosmos. Um, uh, let me see if I can find it. No, ski. We were a Cosmos house. We didn't watch other science. Uh, this, yeah. Jacob Bernowski, that was his name. Jacob Bernowski, he died in 74. Gosh, so this that show was old. The Ascent of Man. And, uh, I don't remember that one. Yeah, it was uh, it was uh, a lot like uh, Cosmos. And did you ever watch The Nature of Things? Mm-mm. Or Connections? Nope. I watched Civilization. That's a good show. That was all right. That was all right. No, that's not science. Connections was Burke, or James Burke, I guess, and he would talk about you know, how all these different little scientific discoveries had, you know, built upon each other. And then, you know, somebody recorded, a, you know, somebody's voice on magnetic tape. You know. yeah, there, but, you know, Bernowski, um, uh, Connections, that spark, um, th- those, those folks had a more of a, an optimistic view and uh, held humans in higher regard than Sagan. I don't think that, Tyson has a personal philosophy whatsoever. He is a recording machine, and people say things that he doesn't think are true, and then he says, well, actually, you know, the studies show, and there's nothing there. Did you ever watch uh, the Val Val Kilmer movie, Real Genius? No. A wonderful bit of 80s fun. Uh, It's about... It's about... uh, uh, some 14-year-old or 15-year-old kid gets into Caltech. It's it's not actually Caltech, but it's Caltech. Right. And gets to work on a, a laser program where the big plot twist, spoiler, is in the middle. They find out that, you know, the old burnout who lives in the steam tunnels figures out what they're building the laser for. You know, why mm. would they need a mirror? 
for a targeting system. And so it's they're basically building a laser drone, which was the big moral quandary of this movie. And now, of course, we have drone killings all the time and right. nobody seems to care. And I just remember the boss uh, of Val Kilmer's character uh, ran one of those science shows when he wasn't being a professor and taking government money to build laser drones. <laughs> and the tagline at the end of the show was, and remember, we know more than you do. That's right. It's all that matters. I love that movie. Young Val Kilmer. I have, I just looked on my uh, network storage device and I have all of the Ascent of Man shows on there. Very good. <sighs> uh, now, we philosophers, first of all, water, when at its coldest, is ice. Now, we philosophers, I hope that I may class you and myself together in this case. Speak of water as water, whether it's being it solid or liquid or gaseous state, we speak of it chemically as water. So that's all interesting. But for me, uh, I just like his little aside there. Now, we philosophers, I hope that I may class you and myself together in this case. Well, what does he mean? In, in water or in being a philosopher? Course. A lover of wisdom. That's the whole point of the lectures. Isn't necessarily to get you. No, it's not primarily to get you the products of combustion of the candle. It's to get you awake to the wonder of investigating the products of combustion of a candle. Isn't this neat? Let's blow stuff up. Let's let me show you how we thought through this. If the listener goes back and checks out our show we did on Walker Percy's The Loss of the Creature. Yes. You'll you, you'll hear about hear us talk about. God, hell, don't listen to us talk about it. Go read Walker Percy's Loss of the Creature. It's 15 pages or something. He talks about a biology instructor helping a student dissect a dogfish. And he says that the that the proper the proper way to do this would be you know, to to uh, not to interpret what the what the what the student is seeing, but to point at what they should see, and, and to not to not mediate the thing, but to make sure they discover for themselves. And, and so, if he if he wants you to be a philosopher with him, then that's that's what he wants. That's what he's trying to do here. But I but I wonder I wonder. Okay, so he's doing these six lectures in London for these kids, and he does it every summer for a number of years. Like, is this is this like the beginning of infotainment? Though, like, is is he is he really doing a good like Persian job of this? And and or or is this just or is this just you know Carl Sagan's cosmos? Is he just doing that? Can virtue be taught? Can you take kids who are not philosophers, show them a bunch of stuff, and have them become so? Yeah. Yeah, maybe. I mean, what's he doing? Maybe do one of them. What's he doing? You know, it, it says at the beginning of my book, it says here, let me see. I'll just read this little chunk here. Um, in 1812, Michael Faraday was 21 years old. His seven-year apprenticeship to bookbinder, French name, had just terminated. It seemed as if his study of science was ending as well. Michael's family was poor. And he had been apprenticed when he was 14. He'd enjoyed working in the Frenchman's shop where he was allowed to spend almost as much time reading books as he did binding them. He became interested in, in electricity while binding a volume of the Encyclopedia Britannica, which the subject was discussed. Um, in 1812, he learned out that he would have to give up all of these pleasant pastimes and set about a dreary business of earning a hard living. Um, in desperation, Faraday sent off letters to anyone he could think of who might help him find work, however menial, that would allow him to be in a scientific laboratory. He wrote pleadingly to Sir Joseph Banks, then the president of the Royal Society, and did not receive a reply. His first break came late in October when Sir Humphrey Davy, experimenting a little recklessly, injured his eyes and was unable to read or write for several days. On the recommendation of a friend, Davy took young Faraday on as a temporary secretary. The acquaintance and the job was brief, but evidently, uh, evidently uh, Michael made a good impression. The following spring, when William Payne, the fag and scrub, I don't know what that means, of the Royal Institution was caught brawling and got himself sum summarily dismissed from his job, Faraday was offered the position. I think he was the janitor. 
Uh, he was offered free lodging in two rooms on an upper floor of the Royal Institution building on uh, Albemarle Street, plus money for candles and a guinea a week for wages. Where was his children's lecture? Like, what are we doing? We never had one. Never had one. Well, that's a different question. How do you... It's a question of education. What are you doing when you educate people? Are you educating anybody? Is it even possible? Uh, it's a... Uh, what do you think? I... I think you can get people competent at repetitive tasks. Training. Yeah. Yeah. This is your job that you'll be doing. Put this widget on this spot, you know, fill out this HR email. I mean, you can get people to do that kind of thing. Um, I don't know that we ever put that podcast out. One of the first things we ever recorded was Nietzsche on education. Uh, I don't know if we did or not. We were sitting on the porch in, in Missouri somewhere, and we talked about it. I think I think that's where we were. Yeah. But he makes this point. It's one of his early books. Uh, he thinks education um, isn't for the masses. It's for the genius. That you know, you're going to get all these people through the school. Well, they're going to be kind of the same way they're going to be. But you're hoping that uh, when a Faraday comes through, that he's got the materials at hand that he can he can light up. Uh, what you would hate to have happen. I, can virtue be taught? This is a question from the Mino, and probably not. Probably not. At least not uh, not this kind of virtue. But it could probably be squashed. That's you, for you sure. Know, so, and you'd want to not squash it. So you, so maybe some kid comes through these lectures and uh, lights up. I don't know. We don't have the course list. Maybe somebody comes in and lights up. And everybody else, you know, they, they go off and they, it's Victorian England. They, you know, become Victorian Englanders and lead ordinary lives and, and uh, in the patent office or whatever. <laughs> the patent um, office where... Einstein wrote his lies. <laughs> I think Anthony Trollope worked in a patent. No, I think he was in a customs office and wrote enormous novels. Yeah, so is the juice worth the squeeze, you know? What are we doing? Uh, well, I don't know. I mean, we're at... Uh, I don't know. It's... <sighs> Is the juice worth the squeeze? Probably not. We spend a whole lot of money on uh, public education, and we're not, in my opinion, producing a whole bunch of geniuses. Yeah. Uh, people seem to be about as smart or maybe less so than they used to be. Probably less so. But they're more educated in that they've spent many more years in school. Are they more? Are they smarter? Don't think so. So if you were rethinking education, I, I have a pretty high opinion of these lectures. I think they're pretty good. Uh, and so why would you, you send kids to them? Well, not everybody's going to become a chemist, and you shouldn't think that they will. And Faraday's being kind to everybody and saying, I can call you philosophers, and this is aspirational. Probably most of them aren't. Most of them would say, do you see when he broke that bottle? That was cool. They're all a bunch of pickpockets and... <laughs> prostitutes oh, straight out of oliver twist yeah, yeah. um but uh you know maybe somebody so he doesn't get squashed so imagine faraday never got that janitor's gig or didn't know the sorts of things that were possible you know you're you're educating that you're going to get a, a goethe or a faraday not that you're going to make everybody into them you can't so uh what would education be then? Uh, maybe education would be focused on n less on. This is my offhand theory of education. Uh, less focused on, you know, passing a test or whatever, but more focused on the beautiful, the true, and the good. 
more of an attractor to genius rather than it's not that I don't want to say I don't care about everybody else. That's not true. But you just there are some folks that you you're not going to take. Epstein says in his book on the sporting gene, uh, he has a guy who's quoted. He says, I, I, a running coach, I can take a fast kid and make him faster, and I can take a slow kid and I can make him a little faster. I cannot make a slow kid fast. Right. So most of us are slow kids. We get a little faster through education, but not too much. And what you would hope is that your education would be to, to, to so that the, those glorious geniuses that are going to shape your culture and do wonderful things, that they have what they need. I was a slow kid. I mean, well, I mean, we all are. I mean, um, I, I don't know what I think about it. I think it's mostly wasted. But, you know, like, if, if everybody has to run and we can make the slower ones a little faster then that's probably good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but, but your mistake would be when, not your mistake, but a mistake would be when you think, gosh, if I just throw more effort and money at this, I will make the slow kid into uh, an Olympic sprinter. No, you can't do it. You probably shouldn't try. You yeah. definitely shouldn't try. And you can definitely, you can, you know, <laughs> you can definitely teach them to hate running through your efforts, right. you know. I have right. To so... So let's show you neat stuff about candles. This will be cool. Most of you will... You know, it's like teaching people Latin. Yeah, it's good. You should learn some Latin. It's good. It'll, it'll help elucidate the language for you. Most of you will not become Latin scholars. You're not going to read Cicero in the original. You have to be okay with that. It's still worthwhile, I think. Their lives will be a bit better because they'll know some roots of words and their, their grasp of English grammar will be a bit better... It's okay. It's okay to do things badly. Yeah, for sure. <laughs> Chesterton, that, that was one of my favorite Chesterton quotes. If a thing's worth doing, it's worth doing badly. I guess I'm a little bit of a utilitarian, you know? Like, is the juice worth the squeeze? Uh, one of my heroes, I've, I've mentioned Albert J. Nock many times, and I've threatened to read Memoirs of Superfluous Man for the show. He wrote an essay called The, Rem the Remnant. Have you heard of this, Carl? I don't remember. You probably mentioned it. I, I don't think I've mentioned forgotten. it to you. Um, I reread it the other day, and he says the remnant's just a small minority of people that understand the world. You know, they understand nature. They have proper metaphysics. They understand hierarchy. Understand, uh, yeah, and that that when everything's perverse, the remnant has to wait. <laughs> until the dangerous course is run so they can become influential again. I think that's right. So there are a few people. There are a few people. And then in his book, Memoir of a Superfluous Man, he talks. He says that most people are uneducable. He also says most people are trainable, but they actually, mm -hmm. they're uneducable. Uneducable. And... You know, I think that that it'd be great to be able to interview the guy, but I, I think that maybe that remnant are the educable. I think that's probably that's probably right. And, but but it's also okay. You know, you're not. That's that's what humans are like, right? You know, so Dewey it's ain't a, wrong here. Maybe you know what I mean. But Dewey's cutting off the top. Dewey Dewey, uh, Dewey education. There's no room for. For the shining, no, the shining lights, right? Yeah, but that—that's the just trouble. a bunch of you're a bunch of um, uh, uh, modern Twitter calls them bug men, but you're, you're a bunch of the last men through Dewey's education. You're just you're, you're all trained, you you fulfill your function, but what's the point? You know why do it anyway? Right. But see that, um, that, but that's the problem when you start doing the the, the math on, you know, on education. You know, if if we're fair, if if Faraday, me and you and Faraday go to the Diogenes Club and don't talk to each other and think about this all day, you know, 
do, do you bother with the lectures? No, he did. Well, he probably had fun doing them. Yeah, he did. He had that's, to have done them for himself, right? Right. That's enough reason. It is enough. Uh, the, the, but yeah, the, the glory of doing it. I think. And, uh, it's, it's, you it's know, people are listening right now and saying, "Gosh, Hambrick, but you're reading these. I mean, they're immortal. You know, the, surely they've reached, you know, whatever, someone." But you know, even me, I'm exceptional. I mean, I, I know I am. I mean, I'm not the most exceptional. You know, I'm not Faraday. But I'm more edu- educable than some and, and less trainable than others, you know. But I didn't do any of these fucking experiments. Those, those are inverse, by the way. I know. But I didn't do any of these experiments. I mean, I, I'm, just sitting here, I'm just sitting back here in an uh, armchair uh, natural philosopherizing about them, you know? Well, so I'm, I'm black not bill. everybody's... I'm black bill, Okay, bro. so not everybody... Are you going to make a Michael Faraday out of these lectures? Uh, probably not. For the most part, no. Maybe a little bit. Okay, but what is what is the proper function of the human being? I always go back to Aristotle on this. What you know? What are you for? And his answer, and I don't think he thinks everybody can do it either is at the end of the Nicomachean Ethics, and more explicitly at the end of the Eudemian Ethics, it is the contemplation of God. Make it secular if you like. Contemplation of the first cause. And he says, uh, you must not listen to those people who tell you that being men you should do mortal things, but you must strive as much as you can with the best part that is in you uh, and I can't remember the rest of the phrase, but to do it as much as you can. And he says in in De Anima about animals that when they reproduce, they are attempting to do the same thing. They're attempting to participate in eternity to the degree that they are capable. So all those bunnies that are out there in my field, they are doing what bunnies do a lot to touch eternity. So should they not? Just because they can't do what Aristotle did? Well, no, they should do as well as they can. It's still good. And so, you know, um, the, the, the Fagin's gang from Oliver Twist, if they show up at the Faraday lecture, most of them aren't going to get much out of it. But they get something. But that activity itself is worthwhile for them. You know, they don't need to apologize for it. You know, that there is, the good is in the doing. So I don't know that I would do cost benefit on, on that. I mean, he's doing these lectures for free. It's not like it's a we're not setting up a public school system where cost benefit might make more sense. But you know, you do as much as you can. We 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 read these books and we run people through seminars. Uh, how much do you get out of it? Well, it's a big you, problem. I don't know. You got some. You got something out of it. You get little. Uh, I call them thought grenades. You know, they're these little thoughts that pop out. And now you think a little bit wider, a little bit better. It's not nothing. It's a good thing. It's a good thing, even though um, uh, real geniuses are, are few and far between. It's still all right to read this stuff. That's my thought. Yeah, me too. And if you're listening and saying, well, I thought they were going to talk about this Faraday book and about chemistry. We are. Right. <laughs> this is what we do. <laughs> it's, a, it, it's not a recap of the book. It's a discussion born out of the book. Yeah. You should, you should read it. Um, you know, it's conversational. Uh, supposedly, uh, supposedly uh, Faraday gave permission to a stenographer to sit in on these and that stenographer would have taken shorthand and wrote these down to as close to verbatim as possible. And I think that's the case. It, 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 it reads like he's talking to a bunch of kids, like smart kids, good kids. Mm-hmm. And, you know, and who would these kids have been? Come on. I, I, hear, I hear Michael Faraday uh, of the Royal Institute is giving some lectures 
in London on you know the nth of July, eighteen fifty-two. Who's it going to be? Nerds. It's going to be uh, MPs, kids. It's going to be you know. It's not going to be a bunch of. It's not going to be the groundlings. You know, a bunch of, it's not a bunch of kids that paid a groat to get in the, the door and sit in the floor. But I think people should read it. It's a lot of fun. I don't know. Mine is only. I don't know, 80 pages long and it just reads, it, it reads great. And his thought process is brilliant. I just loved it. Oh, Carl. Mm-hmm. <laughs> yes. <laughs> so, yes. Uh, so he starts catching these vapors and gases and some of them are lighter than air. Mm hmm. The hydrogen, and he catches it in an upturned beaker. Upturned, an upside down beaker. Mm-hmm. And then he pours it from an upside down beaker into another beaker, but it's upside down, right? And the CO two is heavier than air, and so he's able to do that in reverse. He's able to do that in reverse. Stuff. But we're used to pouring heavy things into containers, you know, with gravity instead of again it. And I got—I was thinking about that—that that, uh, the the test that they often ha- the Twitter audio often have women do, where they try to tell where the water level will be in a tipped over <laughs> pitcher. The spatial reasoning. Yes. They, they, did you not think of that when you saw the diagram? I I did not. Uh, yeah, it's hilarious. Hilarious. Uh, I didn't know if you pass steam over iron filings, you get hydrogen, but I suppose that makes sense. Because what do you get from oxidation of iron from water? Well, it's going to take the oxygen from the water, which leaves hydrogen. That's cool. I like the mild warnings he gives about uh this is in my book is 86 uh, mr anderson having now been able to get two or three jars of gas we shall have a few experiments to make and i want to show you the best way of making these experiments these are with hydrogen gas uh I'm not afraid to show you, for I wish you to make experiments, if you will only make them with care and attention and the assent of those around you. (laughs) As we advance in chemistry, we are obliged to deal with substances which are rather injurious if in their wrong places. The acids and heat and combustible things we use might do harm if carelessly employed. If you want to make hydrogen, you can make it easily from bits of zinc and sulfuric or muriatic acid. (laughs) You know, with the assent of those around you. Right. Uh, have you ever uh, been in a lab where somebody lit off a bunch of hydrogen? It's like a gunshot. Yeah. That's uh, just, you know, be careful, kids. <laughs> uh, he shows these kids how to weigh gases. Awesome. Uh, he lets us know that muriatic acid was named uh, because there used to be, it, it was thought to be an oxide of a theorized element, murium, which was found later to not exist maybe Mm -hmm. Uh, I don't know that's two hours of it I love it yeah let me see if there's anything else I want to pull Uh, what I another thing I did not know I did not know that if you just collect the air out of your lungs from breathing uh you can put out a candle. I did not know that we got that much oxygen out of the air through breathing, through yeah. respiration. They figure out nitrogen, this inert thing that's not oxygen or carbon dioxide. Did you ever did you ever see the places that advertise high nitrogen air for your tires? But all air is high nitrogen? Yes. No, nitrogen gas well, is better. Well, they'll just fill your tire with, with nitrogen. I don't know. It just is. Because PV it costs- equals NRT. I mean, it... Mm. 
Lecture six, he says, the reason I make these experiments in this manner is solely that I may cause the steps of our demonstration to be so simple that you can never for a moment lose the train of reasoning if you only pay attention. Yeah, and he does. And, and he just, and, and you could just repeat these steps over and over and over again for different, different things and, uh, and figure out what their components are. You know, discover the chemical history of diesel, chemical history of paper, whatever. Um, he says there later at, at in in six, they take he takes some potassium, and um, he says, "Let me see." Uh, no, 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 no. Well, let me take a piece of potassium, a substance which even at common temperatures can act upon carbonic acid, though not sufficiently for our present purpose, because it soon gets covered with a protective coat. But if we warm it up to the burning point in air, as we have a fair right to do. And as we have done with phosphorus, you will see that it can burn in carbonic acid. As we have a fair right to do. Yeah, I think it's cool that it burns. I love that. Mm -hmm. It's cool that it burns. I did not know that it burns in carbon dioxide. You know, it's carbon it's dioxide right is relatively inert. Carl. I didn't think about things that would burn in it. Yeah. Yeah, doesn't he? He gets his carb his carbon dioxide from yeah from uh, oxidizing marble. I think is how he does it because it's just mostly CO two. Mm -hmm. Fascinating. Very cool. I never had a chemistry class like this. We were we were just being the textbook. Yeah. Oh, here's another elegant thing. So he talks about how elegant and crazy th the candle is. Right, because of the melting temperature of the wax and the capillary action and the cup, you know, of, of molten fuel, and it's a solid fuel that's portable. It's, it's just, it's just, it's just. And then, then in his, in his investigation about carbon, he talks about how amazing. He says, suppose all fuel had been like iron, which when it burns, burns into a solid substance. We could not then have such combustion as you have in this fireplace. Here also is another kind of fuel which burns very well as well as, if not better than carbon, so well indeed as to take uh, fire of itself when it is in the air, you see. He breaks open a tube of lead pho pyrophosphorus. The substance is lead, and you see how wonderfully combustible it is. It's very much divided, and it's like a heap of coals in the fireplace. But why doesn't... Yeah. The fact that most of the, our fuels burn without a solid waste makes world the world possible. That was it, I hadn't thought about that. I mean, if you burn I hadn't either. If you had like really good charcoal, it burned to nothing. Yep. Did there, there be nothing in it? So does that mean if you run a, a steam engine out of with good coal that you don't have to sweep out the firebox? Well, I mean, ideally you know, if it was perfect coal, it would just be CO2 and water would be all you would get from it. And of course, there'll be some minerals or whatever. Well, you know, your pellet stove, uh, you burn 50-pound bag of pellets and you're going to get uh, two cups of ash out of it. Mm -hmm. And that ash is actually mostly going to be mineral that the roots drew up from the ground into the sap. You know, it's going to be, you know, yeah, minerals. It's... it's um it's actually not fuel. So what's left behind is not fuel. Yeah. Yeah. And then, and then at the cool. very end of this, he brings it all back and, and tells you, you know, we've been studying oxidation. And this is what you do when you breathe. You know, you're, you're, you're burning these nutrients in your body with, in, in oxygen. And because you do that, uh, there's no ash in your body. You know, you can have a perfect, a perfect exhalate. Um, you know, the portion which is so changed is carried through our lungs by one set of vessels while the air we inhale and exhale is drawn into and thrown out of the lungs by another set so that the air and the food come close together, separated only by an exceedingly thin surface, and the air can thus act upon the blood by this process, producing precisely the same results in kind have we seen in the case of the candle? I mean, 
You know, this this is the yeah. thing all bad junior high teachers miss. Why does this matter? How am I going to use this? Why do I care? Well, the, okay, but the answer to the why do I care, there's never a 100% convincing thing on that. For sure. It, I always ended up, you'd have to say in the end, why should you care? Because it's neat. And if I, you haven't gotten to the stage where you think it's neat, there's nothing that I can do. I've pointed it all out to you. I've shown you how we can blow things up. Um, what makes a philosopher is that sense of wonder. If you don't have it, I can't give it to you. But so you posted this on your, because I spy on you, you posted this on your Twitter, this very last thing. So he's done this whole thing about candles and then connects it to respiration. So if, an extended reading here um, in the lungs as soon as the air enters it unites with the carbon even in the lowest temperature with the body which the body can bear short of being frozen the action begins at once producing the carbonic acid of respiration so all things go on fitly and properly thus you see the analogy between respiration and combustion is rendered still more beautiful and striking indeed all I can say to you at the end of these lectures for we must come to an end at one time or other is to express a wish that you may, in your generation, be fit to compare to a candle, that you may, like it, shine as lights to those about you, that in all your actions you may justify the beauty of the taper by making your deeds honorable and effectual in the discharge of your duty to your fellow men. I think that's very nice. It's very good. Um, they are we are very similar to candles in that we've got the same kind of oxidation going on, but he makes the analogy to a candle as a source of light in the moral sense. I want to point out, he does not say to them at the end that you become natural philosophers like me. Because it's probably not going to happen. Maybe one, maybe one kid will. But what they can do is be honorable and do their duty and be, you know, good. Which is uh, an interesting, so there's a moral at the end of it. So I'm going to show you candles, and that's going to somehow, maybe, uh, through awakening your sense of wonder, that perhaps you too can be candle-like. Does it work? Sure. I mean, it, it's a little clunky, but, you know... <laughs> My eighth grade earth science teacher wasn't didn't tell us, you know, that we, you know, threw the zinc in the in the water and watched it dance around, you know, or the sodium in the water. He didn't say, he didn't wrap it up by, you know, I hope you all end up being good people. Mm -hmm. I hope you all be like zinc <laughs> and cause trouble whenever you contact water. Yeah, the the uses of education. I don't. I, would the kids be worse off for going through this? I don't think so. Certainly not worse off. And they got to play with fire, and their eyes might be open a little wider. Um, yeah, yeah. I liked it. I think it's worth reading. Uh, it it's worth reading. It's an easy read. It's fun. Get off Netflix. Read Michael Faraday. Yeah, Faraday's great. So you've been creeping on my Twitter, huh? Nope. No, that's not true. But I did see that post. Hmm. Did you see my uh, my first Aristotle? Uh, yes. So you have been creeping. Okay. <laughs> Are you going to dox me? No. Ah... <sighs> If, what do you have, like three followers, so you can figure I, out which one? I have like 120, thank you. Uh, okay. I don't know why. I don't know why they want, don't want like hot reading tips. Should be a huge account. You have to, so uh, apparently, Twitter is, I don't know what you think. Well, I, I don't really care what you think out there, dear listeners. Twitter's kind of fun, especially the corner, certain corners of it. Um, and there's this author, Delicious Tacos, who's uh, apparently if you are, if you are blue checked and you have sufficient engagement, Elon will send you a check. 
And so he's decided that he's going to, uh, now that he's blue checked, he's going to post uh, wrong gun facts and wrong. Uh, <laughs> That'll get you the engagement. <laughs> um, so compl- you know, confusing clips and magazines and, and getting the calibers wrong. And he's posting a, a incorrect fitness advice too. Yeah. Yeah, he'll get he'll get plenty of engagement. Nineteen eleven versus Glock. Uh, yeah, that'll be great. What are we going to read next time, Carl? I don't know. I I have a so I ordered uh, Burkhart's book on the Greeks and Greek civilization. Great, it should come in a couple of days uh, because it's been quoted. Might be fun to pull something out of that. Shoot, what else could we do? We need to we need to read a Little House on the Prairie book, one of those Laura okay. Ingalls Wilder books. We've got to get to it eventually. Sure, got, we could do that. Gotsta, gotsta. You like the the house in the? Which one did you you were proposing? Oh, I don't really care. Uh, I, I say one of the first two, uh, Little House in the Big Woods or Little House in the Prairie, one or the other. One or both. I could do both. Yeah, yeah they're so. You, and you haven't read them, is that right? No. Oh, you're, oh, mm, you're so lucky. My kids read them. Yeah, they're, they're great. Yeah, we could do that. We could do that. Uh, yeah, the Greek stuff would be fun just because uh, if you come to the Greek stuff through Plato, well, you have to understand that Plato is not the mainstream of ancient Greek society. He's a reaction to it. And so if you don't know the reaction, it's you can get a little bit of a false picture. So that's why I want that's why I grabbed Burkhart's book. Yep. Just as a guide to future reading. Burkhart. What's the name of it? Oh, on Greeks and Greek civilization, something like that. Is this a favorite of Frog Twitter? Uh yes. Yes. Written in eighteen seventy five. Oh, okay. I think. Well, I'm in. No, I'm serious. I'm in. I don't want to read some shit some guy wrote in 78 about this. I mean, I can't take it anymore. <laughs> I, I can't take it anymore, you Carl. You, you don't want to read that new translation of the Odyssey? Oh, my God. Let me tell you of a complicated man. Oh, my God. This is the Iliad that's coming out. Emily Wilson's I- Iliad. Ugh. No, I can't do it. <laughs> You don't want to just read it, just to to hate read it. No, one of my do a, we're going to do a show on Emily Wilson's Homer. Oh fuck! <laughs> one of my proudest moments of my life, I, I kid you not, was a guy on on, on my great book Slack said, uh, "I'm you know I'm I'm ordering. I'm really excited. I've pre ordered the Emily Wilson uh, Iliad that comes out in September." Uh, or I'm thinking of pre-ordering. I think that's what he said. And I was like, don't bother. It's not any good. It won't be any good. And I haven't read it yet, but I know her Odyssey is an abomination. And he goes, oh, uh, how do you know her Odyssey's no good? Like, uh, do you have a review that you can repost? And I was like, no, I didn't have a review. Like, I went and got my Greek lexicon, and I got my Oxford Homer in the Greek, and I got the Emily Wilson one, and I parsed through the first couple pages. It took me several hours, and I saw that she shit the bed like five times on the first page, like just made stuff mm-hmm. out of whole cloth, just lied, fabric. It's fan fiction. Emily Wilson's Odyssey is fan fiction. It is not a translation. It's like it's like if you wrote the Mal- if you wrote the Maltese Falcon with an alternate ending. Well, she wrote an alternate odyssey with an alternate beginning, middle, and end. Well, she had to rescue it from, you know, its, it's toxic nature. <sighs> oh, oh, so, I, I, so I, I, I busted it down. Like, this is, this is what I saw when I was working through the, the Greek and the Emily Wilson and the whatever. And Pascarella, John Pascarella got in there, and he said I wasn't wrong. He put a finer point go. on it than me because my me working on Greek is real blunt. He put a finer point, but mm. that but that I had not missed the mark and I was I was you know in the right direction. Please me to no end. One of my finest moments. 
Yeah, it is likely that many, it is probable, it is true that many classicists don't actually know Greek. I'm sure that's true. It's hard. The alphabet's stupid. <laughs> <laughs> it's hard. It's um, and it's it's much easier just to read uh, something in English and what some commentator says. But then you're you're ill-equipped to uh, you're ill-equipped to figure it out. I had an argument with a guy who's now a bishop. Uh, Those guys about a passage in I, I don't remember all the details. It's some passage in. Uh, it was about the, the miracle of the loaves and fishes. And it says, Jesus says in the English translation, give them yourselves, of you yourselves give them something. He was trying to make something like they were supposed to give out of their own. He wanted to do the sharing homily, that really what they found is the miracle of sharing. And I was, like, I was looking at the Greek, no, this is not in there. And he was completely impervious to it. Right. And he's an educated, you know, going to Rome seminary, supposed to know Greek, doesn't. Womp womp. So I've got my right channel, my Liddell and Scott lexicon. You know, and I've beat my way through some pieces, you know, when I picked you know, the, the translations of of uh, the Odyssey and the Iliad, actually the Iliad. Uh, I spent quite a bit of time on some key chunks trying to figure out, you know, who who was okay. And uh you know, and we picked we picked the Fagel's translation. I think there are some that are better. You know, for faith. Lattimore is a good contender. Lattimore is really good. It's more faithful, I think. Fitzgerald's more faithful too. Uh, Fagel takes some liberties, but the liberties he takes are to make the story flow better, to make it more readable. He's not lying. Mm-hmm. Um, but anyway, I've spent quite a bit of time on that on that stuff and. It was good for me. Mm-hmm. Tell you the story of a complicated man. <laughs> and she says, who wandering lost. It doesn't, Homer doesn't say he was lost. He says like, uh, through like many turnings and through twists and turns. He doesn't say he was lost. That's a huge, that changes the whole story. If you think, yep. uh, if you think Odysseus is lost, then he's a bumbler. If you think he's, if you think through many twists and turns, he wandered the earth like Cain for ten years. That's a different guy. Yeah. In the first par- two paragraphs, she changes the whole story. How dare! <laughs> Whenever I, I, I think, I just think of the, the theme to Shaft. <laughs> you damn. He's right. a complicated man, and no one understands him but his woman. <laughs> Odysseus. You damn right. So uh, let's read the Greeks and Greek civilization by Jacob Burkhart. That's B U R C K H. I don't know if we can read the whole thing. It's I think it's pretty hefty. But uh, well, let's do it. Let's either that it. or Laura Ingalls Wilder. Ah, hell with it. Let's read Burkhart. Uh, we can get Laura Ingalls Wilder. We need to do that. How how hefty's hefty? Come on, talk to me. Uh, it's like four hundred and something pages, oh, and it's going to be it's, footnotes and it's bathroom reading. When you read Theognis of Megara, he says it's bathroom reading. Nothing to it. <sighs> a, a lot of bathroom trips. I got a high fiber diet, Carl. <laughs> How's the garden, bro? Bro, um, full of cucumbers. That's good. Mine's all. It's mine's pretty neglected, much neglected, but producing. I am not as good at this, or. I've just been sw- clobbered by other things and have not been able to get to the garden as much as I should. I dig it. But we've got a ton of cucumbers. I found out that um, my daughter, number two, was selling jars of pickles for five bucks. And I said, hey, wait a minute. Those are my pickles. Yeah. Where's my money? So I have to I have to work out a fee schedule for that. Mm, yeah, ours is uh, almost done. You know, I've got some tomatoes out there, got some peppers out there, got okra out there, got uh, field peas, but uh, it's it's slowing down for sure. Yeah, I'm hoping the squash come along. They've been slow going, but that's the way they are. We slow and then fast. Mm. Mm. Well, there's that show. 
Uh, thank you guys so much for listening. Mm-hmm. We'll come uh, join us. Yeah, join us. Onlinegreatbooks.com slash podcast. Uh, if somebody wants to see you, uh, where would they find you, Carl? Uh, you could find me, uh, well, there is carlshoot.com, mm. a, my occasionally updated website with some little short form writing. Um, you could find me on Instagram, Shoot Strength, where you could see, uh, I don't know what I post there, training stuff, because we do coach people to lift. You can find me there. You can find me at Barbell Logic. I have a few things there. Um, you will never find me anyplace else because I'm incognito. Mm. Yeah. I'm at Hamrick Scott on Twitter and I'm OG oh, Scott Hamrick on uh, Instagram. That's where I put all my lots of cow pictures, farming pictures go there. Yeah. Try not to confuse the message. All my reading stuff goes on the Twitter mm. and all the, all that. Uh, our agriculture LARP goes on Instagram. Right. You, you don't want to dilute the brand. No, 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 no. Well, there's that. Thank you guys so much for listening. It's been fun talking, Carl. Yeah. Oh, I'm going to go right. pick up our beef tomorrow. Okay. I think I might just bring it by your house. Uh, Tell me when. I'll call so you. I can make sure I'm there. I'll call you. Okay. Yeah. That'll be good. Do you want the fat? <laughs> I do. Okay. So I can make candles out of it. Okay. Very good. Hey, thank you guys so much for listening. We'll talk to you in uh, a little while.